Okay, good evening and welcome to the second annual Stephanie K. Seymour Lecture in Law. I am Janet Levitt, the Dean of the University of Tulsa College Law, and it's just a pleasure to see so many students and faculty and alumni and members of the judiciary and friends and colleagues here tonight. Um, this, this evening is a true labor of love because I'm honoring two women tonight that I hold very dear. First, my mentor, my teacher, a great jurist, and a dear friend, Judge Stephanie K. Seymour. And second, I'll be introducing a colleague, a fellow Seymour law clerk, a former running partner, and I have never, my weight has never recovered since Mary Margaret left Tulsa, um, Mary Margaret Giannini. The Stephanie K. Seymour lecture was established in 2005 by her law clerks with the generous matching support of her family. As far as I know, this is the only lecture in the country in which law clerks endowed and established a lecture in honor of their judge. And I think that speaks for, almost speaks for itself. Um, and so, I wanted to read a little bit from the letter that we sent out when we solicited gifts for this lectureship because it really captures, it was written by several of, of Judge Seymour's clerks and it really captures how the clerks feel and felt about Judge Seymour. So the letter started, we have been honored and privileged to be members of the same family, the family of Seymour clerks. And as all families go through transitions, so is the case with our family. TJ, which stands for the judge, which is what her clerks call her, TJ is about to approach a significant and well-earned professional milestone in joining the ranks of senior judges. Looking forward, the judge hopes that senior status will free a little more of her time to relish those things that she loves, family, grandchildren, and travels. These moments beckon nostalgia. The judge has worked incessantly for 25 years to unravel tricky issues of law and to guarantee justice to all, regardless of socioeconomic, gender, or racial status. And for 25 years, TJ has mentored us and young clerks like us, teaching not only legal skills, but the values that we carry into our own careers. And then the letter goes on to say, we, the undersigned Seymour clerks, propose a special way to celebrate the judge in a way that maintains her commitment to excellence in legal thought and mentorship of the best and brightest law graduates. And then we propose a lectureship that would feature those up and coming law professors who embody the judge's commitment to legal excellence, integrity, and justice. There are several law clerks here tonight, and I just wanted to thank all of them for their contributions to this, like their lectureship, as well as Tom Seymour and his family for their generous contributions. So our second Seymour lecturer, Mary Margaret Giannini, perfectly personifies Judge Seymour's commitment to legal excellence, integrity, and justice. And it's so appropriate that she is our second lecturer. She is currently an assistant professor of law at Florida Coastal Law School, and prior to that, she was a visiting professor at her alma mater, Indiana University. She clerked for Judge Seymour from 2002 to 2006, first as a term clerk and then did such a fabulous job, was invited to stay as a permanent clerk. She graduated from Indiana Law School in, Indian in Indianapolis as first in her class. Before that, she was a librarian. She earned a master's degree in library science. Her scholarship focuses primarily on the areas of victims' rights, restorative justice, and federal courts. And her articles have been published in the Indiana Law Review and most recently in the Yale Law and Policy Review. So please join me in welcoming Mary Margaret Giannini. 
give me a moment to get myself situated. Um, well, thank you, Janet, for such a lovely introduction. Um, it is very much a real honor and joy to be back here in Tulsa, a place that I came to to live for a year, um, ended up staying for four, and really felt like I left a place that I can genuinely call home. Um, I want to say a few things about the person for whom this lecture um, is named, and that is my dear judge, Stephanie K. Seymour. Um, it's such an honor to be speaking here in a lecture named after her. Um, there are many, I mean, I could, I could spend an hour talking about how great Judge Seymour is, and, and that would be a fun evening for all of us, but that's not why we're here. But I want to say that one of the important things that I learned about Judge Seymour is there are ways to be very compassionate about the law without losing our legal foundation and balance, and that there are ways to find justice, whether it's for the victim of a crime or whether it's for the person who's been accused of a crime, may have committed the crime, but's been accused by the, of a crime and then suffers from unfair procedure. And there are ways in both of those situations that I learned through Judge Seymour that justice can be found and wrought. Um, I once described Judge Seymour as a wonderful embodiment of Lady Justice standing, holding the scales, and finding that perfect balance. Um, and I think just Judge Seymour taught me not only in the law to search for that balance, but also in my life to find that balance. So I want to say thank you, Judge Seymour, for all that you continue to teach me. Um, and I think this concept of balance brings me to my topic for this evening. Um, my title is Searching for Reasonableness, Procedural Justice and the Victim's Right to be Reasonably Protected from the Accused. Um, for a variety of reasons, I'm drawn to the topic of victims' rights in terms of my scholarship. And I think that on a very sort of intuitive and gut level, it's very easy to be drawn to victims' rights. I mean, if you're going to pick somebody to want to help out, picking the person who has clearly been wronged by somebody, we may not know who, but clearly been wronged by somebody, um, tends to be very easily the recipient of our sympathies and as well as our sort of fervent desire to make things right. Um, but in the midst of this, my draw to this topic, I, I want to let you know that I often really struggle with it, and for two different reasons. One, which I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about tonight, but I think it permeates how I always come to the subject matter. And um, I'm always very uncomfortable when talk of victims' rights turns into a conversation about removing defendants' rights. Um, it's very natural in the course of observing how we as human beings can sometimes do really terrible things to one another that as a way to try to find a way to fix that problem, we're going to take things away from the person who's accused of doing those horrible things. And, and I, I'm never comfortable when the conversation goes in that manner. Um, the other thing that I find problematic about conversations about victims' rights is that when, when one takes a moment and looks at the types of rights that are given to victims in statute or as people talk about victims' rights, there are a lot of promises that are often made that are then very difficult to fulfill. Setting up people that we say we want to try to help and then not being able to follow through. And that really gets me to my topic for this evening. Um, in October of 2004, Congress passed the Crime Victims' Rights Act which represents probably the most far-reaching piece of federal legislation for victims of crime. And one of the many rights that it affords to victims is the right to be reasonably protected from the accused. And I want to talk about that tonight because I think on its face it promises things it cannot provide. And I, and I think that's problematic. Moreover, I don't think it fits very well within the other types of rights that are afforded to victims under the statute and this inability to effectuate what's promised and then this disconnect with the other types of rights I think then undermines what the victim's rights movement is trying to accomplish and what the federal statute I think is trying to accomplish. So my proffered fix for the problem is to look at a social science area of study called procedural justice which I think supports a lot of the rights that exist that are given to victims 
and try to examine and find ways that this procedural justice framework can help give some meaning and enforceability to a right, which right now I think is rather ethereal and illusory in what it provides. So a brief little roadmap for the students in here. You know, you go to moot court and you want to know where your speaker is going. So this is where I hope we will go together this evening. I want to start out by looking at the right and explain to you why I think it's problematic. Then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some history, a little bit of philosophy, and a little bit of social science about, and use these to describe why I think the right doesn't really fulfill what it's trying to fulfill, um, but then move to a conversation about procedural justice and how it can perhaps solve some of these problems. So problems with the right as it currently exists. As I mentioned, the statute grants to victims the right to be reasonably protected from the accused. Now, whenever you see the word reasonably show up in a statute or in an opinion, you know immediately that that's a huge tempering word that takes away something that we have been given. But even if we were to ignore the word reasonably for a moment, the fact that there is this promise of protection, however we want to define reasonableness, does imply that the government has taken on a duty to protect those who have been deemed victims of crime. Um, and when one looks at the legislative history behind the act, there's certainly some inkling or some hints that yes, this is what Congress meant to do when it passed the statute. So for example, Senator Kyle, who's from Arizona and one of the key supporters of the statute, said this. He said, Congress's concern for the safety of crime victims is appropriate and just. The United States Supreme Court has recognized that the primary concern of every government is for the safety and indeed the lives of its citizens. In the past, victims have been grievously harmed, even murdered, because courts have been inattentive to their needs while making decisions about pretrial release of the accused. So we've got some strong language there about government supposed to be in there protecting us. Similarly, Senator Feinstein, another primary supporter of the statute, was describing the order in which the rights in the statute are listed for victims. And the right to be reasonably protected from the accused is at the top of the list. And she says why it's at the top of the list. And she said, they wanted to reinforce the principle that government's first and foremost obligation to its citizens is to protect them, especially those who have already been victims of a crime. So, you know, if you were a crime victim and you started going back and reading the legislative history, you might get the sense of, hey, I, I have this protection right from the government. Um, however, the argument or the statement that the government has a duty to protect us as individuals from crime rests on pretty shaky legal ground. Um, there's constitutional law precedent, which makes it very clear that we don't possess a constitutional right of protection from private harm by others from our government. So the, a big broad statement that there is this right has to immediately be tempered by an acknowledgement that that right to the extent it exists certainly is not going to exist on a constitutional level. However, even in the opinions where the Supreme Court has said the government has absolutely no duty to protect us from private harm, the court has indicated that governments, whether it's our federal government or our state governments, can create tort-based duties on in government actors to prov provide some form of protection. And certainly, I think when you look at the Crime Victims' Rights Act, which perhaps at times I'll call the CVRA, we'll just see how I interchange that, but um, the Crime Victims' Rights Act certainly looks like the government has said, all right, we're creating some sort of tort duty um, on our government actors to provide some protection. And when we've got this other powerful rhetoric, you think, okay, maybe there is something there. But if you dig a little further with the rhetoric, you see how that promise is much more limited. So we have language from Senator Kyle again, who says, you know, after saying government has this important duty to provide protection, says, but of course, the government cannot protect the crime victim in all circumstances. However, where reasonable, crime victims should be provided accommodations such as a secure waiting area away from the defendant before and after court proceedings and during breaks. And that sounds really different to me, at least, from some sort of promise that I am going to be protected from my offender. Um, similarly, the Attorney General's Office has written a set of guidelines to talk about 
how our members of the Attorney General's Office, whether they're attorneys or Department of Justice employees, how are they supposed to interact with victims and witnesses? And there we see this reiteration of, well, let's do our best to provide secure separate waiting areas for our victims. They also say, well, if victims are anxious about being harassed, we can help them change their phone number. We could, in extreme situations, get them enrolled in witness victim protection programs. But the guidelines also say we want to make very clear that any right to reasonable protection should in no way be construed to require personal protection of the victim, like in the form of bodyguards. So we have this protection, we have the strong rhetoric, and then we've got this really pulling back. Now there's a slight, what I would call a ray of hope, or a realistic articulation somewhere, where Senator Kyle hints that perhaps when we talk about reasonable protection, what we're talking about is consideration of the victim's safety when we're dealing with release decisions. And as I talk, as I will talk a little bit later on, this is where I think we can give this right to be reasonably protected from the accused its most, its broadest meaning and most enforceable meaning. Um, despite how we might try to define the right, there are some other problems with the statute in terms of enforcing it. Um, first, we have some relatively deferential language in the statute about how we're going to hold our government actors accountable. Now, the courts are, are designated or told that they shall afford or shall ensure that victims are, are granted their rights under the statute. So we've got some mandatory language there. But then as, as the statute talks about Department of Justice employees and prosecutors, it says that those individuals shall use their best efforts. So far lower standard in terms of how rights should be afforded. Now, if an employee were not to use his or her best efforts, um, the regulations indicate that if in not using their best efforts, they weren't so misbehaving as to be willful and wanton in their conduct, then they get training on victims' rights. If they are wilton, willful and wanton in their conduct, then they could be subjected to some sort of discipline. Maybe a letter in their file, maybe dismissal, but sort of, but again, not very seemingly harsh um, remedies. Moreover, the statute explicitly disclaims any type of damage liability for government actors should a right not be afforded. Um, the only real enforceable rights that victims have under the statute focus not on a situation where somehow they feel they've been harmed by a private actor because they haven't been given this protection right, but rather on whether or not they have been given certain participatory rights that are granted within the statute and how they can go about enforcing those participatory rights about being present or being heard um, at different of the different aspects of the criminal proceeding. So we have a situation where we have a statute which outlines, out, outlines a right, but then is not clear in defining what that right is, and then to the extent that we want to define that right also creates a very limited set of circumstances in which the right can be enforced. And I think that when you look at the history of the victims' rights movement and sort of what its underlying goals and justifications are, the fact that then we have a statute which grants a right which is poorly defined and seems to be very difficult to enforce is going to, under, I think, undermine the goals of the victims' rights movement. So this is where we move into a little bit of our history and philosophy and into social science. Um, some of you may know this, um, but historically, and I mean this back to early communities and um, early societies, we didn't have the type of criminal justice system we have today. Crime was entirely a private matter between the victim and the offender. And so the state was involved, if at all, in a very, very peripheral nature, and it just got sort of sorted out between the victim and the offender. So today we have the state versus the offender. In very early societies, it was the victim versus the offender, and this has been deemed sort of the private prosecution model. Um, as our societies developed, as we had more, um, more urbanization, more growth of government, we shifted to what was called a public prosecution model. And under the public prosecution model, crime was no longer seen as sort of a private 
act, you know, of one person against another, but instead was viewed as something that harmed us all, that, that the theft, the assault, the murder, even though an individual may have been affected, affected our broad community and required a community-based reaction to a state sort of sponsored criminal justice system. So no longer was it victim versus offender, it was state theoretically acting on behalf of the victim against the offender. But because of that shift in the relationship, the victim was increasingly pushed out of the process. They became a means to an end. They existed to help report the crime, perhaps to serve as evidence or as a witness on behalf of the state. But otherwise, and as described by one court, victims were viewed as Victorian children. They were meant to be seen and not heard or only spoke when spoken to. The other thing about the public prosecution model, as victims were sidelined, is the public prosecution model made clear that victims had no established legal interest in the proceedings. So if I had somebody steal money from me and I reported it to the police and the police and the prosecutors did nothing about it, I couldn't bring an action to force the police or prosecutors to do anything about it. I have no legal interest in seeing the prosecution go forward against the person who had harmed me. And I think this disconnect between the harm to the individual and looking at crime as being, a, as being something that harms the state and that the state has a responsibility to push forward was part of what get, brought rise to the genesis of the victims' rights movement. Um, that while victims might not have a legal interest it would be very hard to say that they were wholly disinterested in the prosecution of the offender. Um, and as stated by one victim, um, the victim stated, you know, the state of New York was not kidnapped, beaten, and raped. I was. Another problem that we saw through this history of the public prosecution model was that not only are victims feeling utterly victimized by the crime rendered against them, but then as they report the crime and then find themselves in a legal system where they serve as a reporting witness, they serve as evidence, but pretty much that's it, suffered from a secondary phase of victimization from their participation in the process. Um, and so when the Crime Victims' Rights Act was passed, one of the statements about why they were, why the legislators were seeking to pass the um, statute, we have this language from our legislative history. In case after case, we found that victims and their families were ignored, cast aside, and treated as non-participants in a critical event in their lives. They were kept in dark by prosecutors too busy to care enough, by judges focused on defendants' rights, and by a court system that simply did not have a place for them. And as stated by one victim, my sense of disillusionment with the judicial system, judicial system is many times more painful than the crime itself. I could not, in good faith, urge anyone to participate in this hellish process. So I think this highlights a problem with what was going on with the public prosecution model. And I contend that as the public prosecution model, for some good reason, became so focused on ensuring that our defendants received due process, which I think is incredibly important, lost a recognition that the victim got us here in the first place. And this gets me to a little bit of, of the philosophy part and the notion of our response to crime being retributive in nature. And when I talk about retribution, I'm not talking about vengeance. And I'm not talking about sort of a, a biblical connotation of eye for an eye. Rather, when I talk about retribution, I talk about it or invoke it as a dignity-affirming action or process. And I take this from the philosopher and scholar Gene Hampton. Gene Hampton proffers that the reason we have criminal justice systems is to create a means of restitution for our victims. It's not restitution in the means in the form of money, but it's restitution through an acknowledgement that we should all on any given day be and balanced. And that when one individual then acts in a criminal manner against another. The, the criminal actor, actor is sending a message that you are less than, you, that you are worth less, and that that message harms us all. That message requires a communal response 
through our state prosecutorial system to alter that message, to send an alternative message, the alternative message being the state says no. And we say no through our criminal justice system, and then if you're found guilty, we say no through an appropriate punishment. So that our criminal justice system serves as a means to vindicate and to bring back up the dignity of the victim that was squashed by the criminal act. Um, but I think that as our public prosecution model had evolved, that retributive aspect of restoring dignity to the victim was lost when victims were increasingly feeling shut out of a process that was supposed to be in part about restoring them to the dignity that had been squashed by the offender. So in response to this growing discontent, we had the evolution and the development of the victims' rights movement. It really got started in the 1980s. Today, it's probably inaccurate to call it a movement. It's very much here. It's present. Um, every state in, in, in our union has passed some form of victims' rights legislation. Over 30 have passed amendments to their state-based constitutions granting rights to victims, and there have been a whole series of pieces of federal legislation granting rights to victims. And when you look at the literature and examine what the goals are, why do we have these rights, I think two themes can come out. One is we'd like to bring in, appropriate, in an appropriate means the victim a little bit more back into the system to try to regenerate that dignity-affirming retributive goal for why we have criminal prosecutions in the first place. And then the second goal, which is allied to our retribution goal, is to try to prevent secondary victimization. That as we are trying to identify an appropriate place for victims within the process, that they're not further harmed, because that further secondary harm then just gets us back to undermining our retributive goals. But then the tricky question is, how do we do this without totally dismantling all that is good about our public prosecution system? How do we keep that balance from remembering that now it is the state versus the offender and don't want to turn it back into some private form of vengeance, which might be one way to explain what was going on during our public prosecution model? And this is where I think the idea of procedural justice help explain our victims' rights movement or the rights that exist to victims today. The notion or the study of procedural justice comes out of social science and has been something that's been studied for about the last 20 years and is largely pioneered by a man named Tom Tyler who's at New York University. And the basic premise of procedural justice as a study of social science is that when one attempts to evaluate an individual's perception of the fairness of official decision-making, the outcome of the decision is not always the most determinative factor, but the process by which the decision was made also plays a huge role in the perception of whether or not that decision was fair. So I want to take a brief moment and distinguish sort of the topic of procedural justice from procedural due process, or the topic of just standard legal procedure, whether it's civil or criminal. I would say that procedural justice is a broader umbrella under which we would place um, procedural due process or our standard rules of civil procedure or criminal procedure. Because certainly I think that most of us would agree that if we encountered a criminal process where our defendant received full procedural due process and all the rules of criminal procedure were followed, even if we didn't like the result, we would say that was fair. Or similarly in a, in a civil trial. If we have our process followed, then we are more likely to say that the result was fair. Um, the trick is to try to talk about civil procedure or even criminal due process and um, for crime victims doesn't fit because they don't have an interest in the proceeding. Um, but I think that when we look at some of the broader goals of a procedural justice construct, it can help us give victims a place within the process and some meaning to the rights that they are afforded, at least under the federal statute and under a lot of other state statutes. So when social scientists try to evaluate what do people look for to try to determine whether a proceeding is fair, um, there are four basic categories. 
One is that the participant has an opportunity to tell their story or use their voice, which I think is particularly important in the victim's rights arena. The second is that the authorities involved are perceived to be unbiased or principled or neutral. The third is that the authorities are trustworthy and perhaps even caring. I think that's sometimes hard to make happen just because you shouldn't have to necessarily care um, to still do a good job. Um, and then the fourth one is that the participants are treated with dignity and respect. And I don't think that this means sort of bow down, but treated as a co-equal fellow human being. So why should we care about perceptions of fairness? I mean, there is a question of like, who cares? Like if we, if we follow the rules and we get to the right decision, who cares if anybody thinks that it's fair or not? And I think there are two arguments. One is a, a legal-based argument and one is a psychological argument. From a legal perception, um, a legal-based argument, when people and studies have supported what I'm about ready to say, when someone undergoes a process and at the end of the process they perceive that the outcome is fair, that increases their perception of the actual legitimacy of the process and then further leads them to their willingness to not only comply with the decision but to comply with further proceedings and at least in a criminal environment leads to reduced criminal activity. So there have been studies that have been done where offenders who might not like the outcome, they get arrested, but felt like they were fairly treated during the course leading up to the arrest, show low levels of recidivism as compared to offenders who in a similar situation weren't arrested. So there's a, there's a sort of crime control factor in here as well as sort of a, 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 an increasing of the legitimacy of the process that's involved. Now this leads, I think, to the next question of, well, like, this doesn't fit with victims, right? Victims weren't the ones, we're not concerned about victims breaking the law. Um, you know, they were the ones who allegedly were behaving and then somebody else is misbehaving, and um, now they find themselves into the criminal justice system. Um, however, I think that victims' perceptions of fairness of the process is extremely important, one, because of our concerns of secondary victimization, that if victims find themselves involved in a process which is perceived not to be fair, then their, their willingness to further cooperate with that process or their willingness to report future crimes is undermined. Um, I also think that it's really easy when we talk about victims' rights to immediately have within our head the construct of the really, really good victim and the really, really bad defendant. And so that our good, good victim would never, ever be in a position of being a defendant tomorrow. Well, that is not always the case. And in a lot of criminal environments, today's victim could very easily be tomorrow's defendant. And so having anyone who enters the criminal justice system as the non-offender but encounters the system and perceives it to be fair then could have this positive effect in terms of undermining or, or lowering recidivism rates. So those are some of the legal arguments of why I think it's important to ask, is this process perceived to be fair? From a psychological perspective, and I think this is important too when we talk about victims' rights, studies indicate that we generally as human beings um, want to feel like we are deemed full-fledged members of society, that we are treated with dignity and general respect. And when we encounter fair procedures, when we, when we believe that we have been, treating, been treated fairly, then that sense of being a full-fledged and equal member of society is, is held up. And I think when we think about why we have the victims' rights movement, we want to reaffirm the dignity and the wholeness of our victims, we want to undermine secondary victimization, then asking whether or not victims' involvement in the system and victims' perceptions of how the victim is treating them, that the system is treating them, is very important to further that retributive goal as well as to diminish the concerns of secondary victimization. And I think that when one takes then a moment and looks at the other types of rights that are afforded to victims under the Crime Victims' Rights Act, I think we see a really nice embodiment of these procedural justice um, ideas. Um, because the other rights, aside from the right to be reasonably protected from the accused, focuses on giving victims participatory rights 
in the system that is separate from any role that they may play with the state, so any means to an end that they may serve for the state. So just so you have a notion of what these process-based rights are. Victims are meant to be given timely and accurate notice of public court proceedings, which would include parole proceedings or the release of the accused. They have the right not to be excluded from such public proceedings, and there's some very justified exceptions to the presence right. Um, they have the right to be reasonably heard at certain hearings or public proceedings that, are, that regard the release, the plea, or the sentencing or parole determinations of the offender. They have the right to confer with a government attorney, and they have the right to proceedings free from unreasonable delay. And that's a little problematic because that bumps up against the defendant's right to speedy trial right, and, and courts and scholars are still trying to figure that one out. But these rights are very, very process-based. Now, just so that we're clear what the rights don't give the victim. They don't give the victim the right, if they've been denied their rights, for a new trial for the defendant. So the victim doesn't have a veto power. They don't have the control to con the power to control the proceedings or the outcome. But they have this limited set of rights where they can be present and where they can be heard in a variety of settings. Um, in this regard, then, I think when we look at the rights that the CVRA pr does provide to victims and think about what Kant guides us, in that we're not meant to treat one another as solely means to an end. I think a legitimate criticism of the public prosecution model is that victims really became solely a means to an end for the prosecution against the offendant. Um, what the CVRA does, and when we look at procedural justice and how it asks, does, do our participants feel like they're being treated, treated fairly? And the CVRA then says to victims, here are a variety of places where we will acknowledge this crime is about you, you should be able to be present, and in limited circumstances, you should be allowed to be heard. You can't control the outcome. You can't, you can't appeal a final decision. But you have the right to be heard means that victims are no longer being treated solely as a means to an end. They're being acknowledged in their individual capacities and are given a small place, um, but I think real and enforceable place in which to participate in the process. And in terms of the enforcement, what the CVRA does grant the victims then is when they've been denied their right to be heard at plea hearings or at sentencing hearings, they can set into motion a very limited time frame appeal process so that our defendant isn't hanging out there forever to have the potential of the plea hearing being redone or the sentencing hearing being redone. And there's a little bit of case law out there where that indeed has happened and those rights have been granted to the victim. So this brings me back round now to my reasonable protection right. Um, when we look at what I think the victim's rights movement is trying to accomplish, let's reintegrate our victim, let's try to bring something back to our retributive goals, let's try to prevent secondary victimization, the right to be reasonably protected doesn't fit. One, I think it sets victims up thinking they're going to get something that they're not going to get, so that when they don't get it, now we have secondary victimization because they feel abused by the process. It's not fair. Um, I think we also have a right which is talking about a brand new relationship which exists between the victim and the government that doesn't have to do with participation or in the process, but has to do with now there are these specific duties that the government has to the victim, which I don't think are very enforceable, um, and don't really talk about lifting the victim back up to a new, newly restored dignitary level. Rather, it's talking about protecting the victim from further private harm, which we know is not something that is easily enforceable and certainly something that is not based in um, a constitutional level of protection. So how to take this problematic right and use procedural justice to give it some meaning? My first suggestion is let's pick up on the language from our framers, this hidden language that says that perhaps we're not really talking about protection, but we're talking about consideration of the victim's safety. 
So let's just be a little bit more honest and upfront about what we can do. Um, and the curious thing is that earlier versions of the language, which eventually appeared in the Crime Victims' Rights Act, hinted or spoke in these terms. So we have some language from, from proffered versions. One says that victims should have the right to have their safety considered in determining a defendant's release from custody. And a second version was that the victims have the right to adjudicative, adjudicative decisions that duly consider the victim's safety. Um, and a number of state statutes that have similar language follow sort of a let's consider the victim's safety. Some even are much lower than that. Victims have the right to be told what the victims can do to protect themselves from the offender. So it's an information providing service rather than sort of a duty to create protection rights. Now, in shifting the language to have it be far more consideration of the victim's safety, it's not all that radical of a suggestion on my part because there are already places within the law that incorporate this idea. And it shows up specifically in the Bail Reform Act, which addresses what courts are supposed to do when they have defendants in front of them and are deciding whether or not the defendant should be released pending trial. And the Bail Reform Act, in a couple different places, directly indicates that consideration of the danger that the defendant may pose to the community is certainly something the courts can include in their calculus as to whether or not they're going to release the defendant. Similarly, should the defendant be perceived to attempt to threaten, injure, or threaten not only witnesses, jurors, but also victims, then there's ground for the court to decide to retain the defendant. And even if the court were to decide to let the defendant out on conditional release, there's language in the Bail Reform Act which says that the court should direct our defendant, you got to stay away from the victim um, and create that sort of buffer of consideration of the victim's safety. Um, so we've got places already within the law that could put up hold a reframing of what's in the Crime Victims Rights Act talking about considering the victim's safety rather than setting the government up to provide a protective duty that one, it may not legitimately or logistically be able to do, but second, sort of undermines trust that we may be trying to build up in our victims as they encounter our system. Um, then I think, and this is where our procedural justice ideas really come into play, we revise our language and we acknowledge that we've already got a vehicle through the Bail Reform Act to try to um, really focus courts on thinking about victims' safety. Then when we look at the other process-based rights which exist in the statute, which I think are very much grounded in this procedural justice framework of creating a system that creates fairness or a perception of fairness in our victims through their ability to have notice of the proceedings, their ability not to be excluded from certain proceedings, their ability to be heard at proceedings, then gives victims a way to show up and actually exercise these rights so that they are participating in the process and that they are being heard. Um, however, I think there then needs to be one more important legislative tweak to the Crime Victims' Rights Act, because the Crime Victims' Rights Act, when it talks about what do we do when victims are denied the rights to be heard or the rights to be present, the only two situations that are referenced are plea hearings and sentencing hearings. And we don't have anything referenced about if we have a release hearing do victims have the right to have that hearing reinstituted so that they can be heard as to the court's decision as to whether or not to release or detain, um, retain the defendant? And so I think that's another place where our legislative language needs to be tweaked to highlight that this is an environment where consideration of the victim's safety needs to be focused and so that everybody who reads the statute knows that this is an environment where the right, if the right has been violated, there is a remedy. And again, by providing this type of remedy, I'm not encouraging a huge, massive stretch in the law. If we go back to our Bail Reform Act, it makes very clear that at any time, the court can go back and reopen the hearing proceedings. So if the court ever gets information that would cause it to feel like it was important to revisit its decision to release or detain the defendant, 
then the court can certainly go back and engage in that reinvestigation. Um, so, and, and as to whether reopening a plea, whether, whether we reopen a sentencing hearing or whether we reopen a release hearing, of those three, I would argue that the release is probably the least violative of our defendant's rights because we've already got language in our statute, our bail reform statute, that says if our defendant is out and then engages in untoward behavior, the court can absolutely come back and say you're going back into jail or you're going back into detention, or if the court gets new information, then the um, defendant is already on notice for this narrowing of their ability to be free. So to kind of wind up and then be open for any questions, I think when we think about some of the problems that our public prosecution model created for crime victims, it became so focused on ensuring, I think, that our defendants got procedural due process, which I think is extremely important, but in so doing, our victims got shut out, and we lost part of the reason why we have criminal justice or criminal proceedings in the first place, which was, in part, to vindicate our victims. And procedural justice helped bring victims back into to the criminal process not to undermine our defendants' rights, but to give them limited and appropriate voice in the process. And I think the majority of the rights under, crime, under the Crime Victims' Rights Act do this because victims aren't in control, they don't have veto power, but they have places where they can be present and they can be heard. Victims don't have the right to testify in trial unless they're called, so they can't be in control of the actual adjudicative process of guilt. But when we're talking about sentencing, or when we're talking about the initial plea, and as I am arguing, when we're talking about release of the defendant, having the victim's voice be heard in that process certainly goes a long way, I argue, in increasing the victim dignity in the process, will decrease the secondary victimization that I think a lot of victims felt under the public prosecution model, and reaffirm affirm their dignity from a retributive standpoint. Um, so even though at the end of the day what I'm arguing is that the right to be reasonably protected really isn't a right to be reasonably protected, it's a right to have victim security and safety considered in judicial systems, I think lowering that expectation, but then in lowering that expectation, actually providing some tangible means by which that, ex that expectation can be realized furthers the victim's rights movement. It means that we have victims who have a grounded sense of what they can expect from the system. They have a statute that helps them effectuate those. They don't have a sense of disappointment and then secondary victimization concerns. And they know that while we want to ensure that our defendants receive their procedural due process, that our victims do have an important and honored and recognized place um, within um, the process of bringing offenders to justice. So, thank you for listening, and I'm certainly open to any questions, <laughs> comments. Yes, ma'am. Um, there, are, there are a lot of states that have language, reasonable protection language, as opposed to safety language in their statutes. The trick is, is that there's not a whole lot of, if any, case law on the state level. I can tell you a story about Oklahoma, who doesn't have reasonably protected from the accused language, not Oklahoma, Utah. Um, and Utah, here's what Utah promises victims. Utah gives victims the right to be free from harassment and abuse throughout the criminal justice process. They also have the right to be present and to be heard at release hearings from the defendant. They also have the right to be informed of the level of protection that they can receive from the state, but then the statute refers to two statutes, two other statutes, but that are really about witness tampering and threats to the, to the victim. So if there's a violation of those two statutes, then what the victim knows they get is a prosec another prosecution against the offender for those statutes. So we don't have an explicit promise of protection, but I, I 
read about, and I only have very sketchy facts on it because I'm playing phone tags with the lawyer who was involved in this, but there was a case that came out of Utah recently where there was some success, or some limited hopeful success, in how we look at the victim's right to be free from harassment and abuse throughout the criminal justice process. Um, the defendant was released on bail. The victim hadn't received their notice of the hearing, so they hadn't been able to and so the victim got in touch with Utah's Crime Victims Advocacy Group, and um, they immediately filed a petition. They had a hearing before the judge, so the victim's rights were violated here. They need to be heard. The judge had a new hearing and um, changed its mind, set bail a lot higher, and the defendant was, was held. So here we have a situation where we don't have this explicit promise of protection, but we have a promise of being heard, we have a promise, this promise of being free from harassment and abuse, but through the procedural part of the victim's rights, the victim, I think, came out on the other side, believing that there had been some fairness in the process and that they were honored in the process. Right, um, and, and the trick is, is that if you have a situation where your offender, your defendant, does engage in bad behavior, and somebody is harmed or injured, um, there I don't there's I don't think there's a remedy for that. The remedy is against the offender. It's not going to be against the state, or the extent to which you have remedies against the state are going to be so limited and tend to be generally limited by state tort immunity law. And you're going to have language in the statute similar to what we see in our federal statute saying only for willful and wanton behavior on behalf of state actors is there going to be liability. Or you have to get around the tricky tort-based argument of if we have a, a right established in a statute that imposes a duty on our state actor, does that, is that duty for the general public? And if the duty is for the general public, then there's no duty. Um, the exception to that is does that duty in tort law conversations create what they call a special duty. And most of the case law from state to state about identifying a special duty is so limited and hard to get through that enforcement does become very difficult. But I think, so this is, I think that if we look at this protection right and look at it more at the victim's right to be heard and considered in the process, then there's more ability to enforce that. There's more ability to enforce that the victim get, gets heard than the ability to enforce that a private actor is going to behave. And if we want to decrease secondary victimization, and we want to have victims feel like the criminal justice system really is responding to them, then the hearing right, I think, is a better way to go than to say, we're making these promises to you that we're not going to be able to enforce. They're very difficult to enforce. Does that answer your question? I think in the best of all worlds, it would be lovely if it were amended to clarify what's being afforded. In the meantime, I think that there's at least one decision that doesn't, that in dicta, acknowledges some of the things that I'm talking about in terms of how this protection right can be given meaning beyond a presumption that you're going to have bodyguards driving you to and from the courthouse. But um, I think for clarity's sake and I think for, for the legitimacy or the continued legitimacy of the victims' rights movement, being clear about what is actually being afforded to victims is important, which is why I would proffer re redrafting would be the best way to go because otherwise you have to wait for a situation to come up and hope that the courts are going to address it. And, you, and, th and that could take, could take years. Mm -hmm. So, yes, sir. Well, the uh, research that you've done in the perpetrator of sexual harassment and sexual harassment, what is the Well, one of the social, the social science studies that kind of looked at procedural justice actually had to do with domestic violence. And what, what, 
the study was a follow-up study on a series of studies that were done in Minneapolis in the 1980s where the question there was, what's the, how's the, how do we best respond to domestic violence? Do we tell the perpetrator, cool off, stay away from each other for a while, take a walk around the block, or do we arrest? And which is a better response in terms of reducing further violence? And so the Minneapolis studies seem to suggest that arrest was the better response than the cool off period. So in the 1990s, there were a follow-up set of studies. And again, the question was, or what the, the social scientists did was compare how did those who got arrested feel about their process as opposed to those who didn't get arrested. And they asked some questions like, well, how did the police officer talk to you? I mean, it wasn't sort of, did you, did you feel like you received procedural due process? It really was, you know, was, was the officer respectful? Did the officer listen to your side of the story? Um, and then what the study did is looked at what was the rate of recidivism as between those who got arrested. That would be like the bad outcome, you know, I don't like the outcome, but I thought it was fair, as opposed to those who didn't get arrested. And it turned out that the numbers were really similar and in a re where you have people who were connected and in a relationship. Um, what I think needs to be done more is look at, um, there are not a lot of studies actually looking at victims individually, um, separate and apart from their relationship or lack of relationship with the offenders. And based on what they're told about the rights that they have, then what do they think as they work their way through the process? Yes, sir. That's an excellent question. Yeah. So now as a law professor, tap dancing a little bit. Um, the first thing I would say is that my sense about what the legislative goals were in terms of reasonable protection was far more about physical protection as opposed to asset protection. Um, the second thing I will say before I really start tap dancing is that I don't know a lot about financial security law. So everything I say now is going to be based on very, very limited knowledge. But the limited knowledge I do have is that I know that there are a variety of statutes already in place in terms of how do we deal with these seizures of, of funds. And what I know about them is that they're inc incredibly complicated so that in like the Madoff there may be victims who were part of the earlier part of the Ponzi scheme who got money, who may actually then be subjected to having that money in terms of creating a pool of relief. And, um, and honestly, I don't know how the law is going to sort that one out. So to get back to what I do know I like to talk about with the measure of intelligence, um, one of the interesting things that did go on with the made up um, a variety of victims shown up, showed up and were given the right to be heard. Um, now, I didn't hear in the news people specifically back, but I am sure that that, you know, those victims showed up. Somebody said to them, you do have a right to be heard at these proceedings. They didn't have a right to be heard at release proceedings. The one case that really talks about 
the victim's right to be reasonably protected from the accused is actually a mail fraud case where physical protection is really not a big deal, but where the court said, you know, the victims didn't get their rights heard at the original release hearing, and the judge had decided to retain the defendant anyway because they didn't think the defendant was going to show up. But when they had a second release hearing, the judge said to the prosecutors, you better be sure to have informed all the victims. And none of the victims wanted to exercise their right to be present. But the judge, even in an environment where safety wasn't an issue, the court said the victims still have a right to be present. The only other trick when we think about something like Madoff, where the extent of our victims may still be in process of discovery, is that one of the things that the Crime Victims' Rights Act does is, again, uses that word reasonableness and acknowledges that in times you're going to have times where you have multiple victims. And so giving everybody the right to be heard and the right to be present might become impractical. And so it gives courts some space to try to come up with other ways to provide that process-based right so that the victims feel like they have been treated with fairness under this act. I wish I could speak more intelligently and eloquently on the financial part, but any more than I've done would be a pure lie and really embarrassing. Going back to procedural justice and your definition of the city, to be contested, but I really said that I liked it, I was drawn to very much an example in my area, which is international law, dealing with international mass crimes, et cetera, where on the truth commission, so through voice, neutrality, trustworthiness, and dignity, the sort of victim and perpetrator facing each other in Congress or the committee on the story seems to have had that dignified impact that seemed to satisfy your justice. So on the issue of it, I'm giving you the state. What is the role of the state? And because in the South Africa case, where you had victims and perpetrators shooting in crime, laughing, and then embracing in some cases, the state was a state of disaster. And so I just wanted to push you a bit, maybe back to the private rights model. I think I know what your answer would be, but I want to push it. Certainly from a private rights perspective, you could have somebody bring a tort action. If I have been murdered, I could sue somebody for wrongful death. These were not torts. These were truth sessions. The truth sessions. I certainly, I mean, here's what I would say. I certainly think that there are places where those retributive goals could be furthered and might even be achieved in a more effective environment than what state-sponsored prosecution can allow. I think that, and I would love to see more of that going on. However, I think that we have, as a nation, taken this law and given it a great deal of reverence. In some ways, it has become our new church. It's the place where we go, argument, the place that we go to have rights and wrongs be addressed and acknowledged and then have an official statement come down of this is wrong. And so if that is how we respond to this structure, are there places within that structure where the involvement of victims can be increased and that dignity-enhancing factor be recognized? I mean, there's certainly an argument. Some would argue that retribution is very distributive and so is not a dignity-affirming thing. While I think my approach to retribution is not my approach, but the approach that I've picked up from Jean Hampton is more restorative in that it's trying to seek restoration for the victim and the types of things that you talk about in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There's also far more of a potential of restoration for the offender. 
Um, and, and I think that's extremely important. So I just think because of the, the great weight and power we give to our judicial system, can we not infuse within it more this sort of sense of perceptions of fairness for everyone involved? Yes, ma'am. Not specifically in, in this context, but that is certainly something, that's a place where I want to spend some more time investigating and thinking and writing um, about restorative justice processes and how they can be my view of retributive goals and ideals, and then how they might form our judicial processes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I Well, it doesn't. I mean, that's yeah. one of the things. I mean, it, it, it limits it. Um, I think it's a very practical response. Um, I think, I mean, because I think that if you put public actors in a position of knowing that if they make a mistake, they could be subject to financial liability, then those individuals are going to say, I'm not going to be a public actor. I will, I will find a job elsewhere. Um, and it's a very consistent response, whether we're looking at a state level or a federal level, that um, we really want to encourage our public actors to do their job. With, and, and we have our willful and wanton language so that when somebody is clearly misbehaving, they can be held liable for that. But that otherwise, we all make mistakes. We all are negligent from time to time. And the question is, do we want our public actors to be subject to that liability? It's problematic, though, because you will have situations where perhaps someone wasn't willful or, or wanton, but they might have been very, very negligent, grossly negligent, and then you have someone who's subject to But I think that by looking at the rights under the CVRA as process-based rights, so it's really the victim's relationship with the legal process, then we don't have to get into a conversation about individual liability because it's how this broader process and the victim are interacting as opposed to what a judge does or a prosecutor. And they have prosecutorial or judicial immunity anyway. I mean, so you can't sue them. So um, by looking at, by seeking the, by creating a right that has a remedy through process as opposed to a tort remedy, um, I think we create more meaning and enforceability and substance to the protection rights. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Mary Margaret, we see reflected in you the qualities that both you and I admire so much about Judge Seymour, the ability to stay grounded and very focused on the bounds of the law, but at the same time be being very pulled towards broader theories of, of justice and, and striking that balance, like you said. And um, in recognition, and to thank you, we have a gift somewhere. Oh, it's back. Um, and hopefully this will foreshadow your turn towards doing some research in the Native American oh. legal communities. This is a vase by a Native American artist named Mel Cornshucker. Ah, Shucker, Shucker. Um, and um, we Thank you. give this to you as a token of appreciation Thank for you. a wonderful talk and hope that you'll come visit us often and hope that you'll stay um, to chat informally with Absolutely. Mary and Margaret. So thanks. Thank you very much.